Hi, and welcome to week seven, Lessons from Mount Sinai. Now, we often ask, who is God and what is he really like? These questions are essential to understanding God. And over the next few minutes, we're going to unpack a little bit about God's character and how we can communicate that to an audience um, in church or in a Bible study uh, by looking at a passage and determining aspects of God's character. When I teach an introduction to, to the Bible course, the first thing I often hear is that God of the Old Testament is a harsh and judgmental God, while the God of the New Testament is a loving and caring God. But is this really true? Does God change his character between the two testaments? While the Old Testament does show God's holiness through his judgment, it is clear that God's mercy always trumps his judgment. To analyze this, this, this idea, today we're going to explore the narrative of the golden calf in Exodus 32 and see how this passage informs us and what we can learn about God's character. The narrative of the golden calf falls between God's discussion with Moses on Mount Sinai, um, where Moses has gone up the mountain to receive the law and the description of the tabernacle, leaving the people of Israel at the base of the mountain. Beginning in Exodus 32, we find that the Israelites grow concerned that Moses has been gone too long and they approach Aaron, Moses' brother, saying, Up, make us gods who we shall go before. Uh, as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. The people very quickly turn to Aaron for new gods, which they might follow. In doing so, they give up their gold and valuable items that were a gift from God as they were leaving Egypt. This amazing lack of faith is surprising because the people have witnessed several dramatic events by God's hand. In addition, Aaron has been integrally involved with the Lord and with Moses through each interaction with Pharaoh and the Exodus. Despite Moses's, I mean, despite Aaron's direct involvement, it seems that he initially goes along with the plan to form new gods. In verse 5, we see signs that Aaron may recognize his failure as he redirects the worship of this new idol to the Lord, which seems almost an afterthought, and then not to the traditional Baal as the bull god. In any event, God recognizes the failure of the people's faith and speaks to Moses in verses 10 to, or 7 to 10, where God says, or when the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, let my wrath, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. And by this we see that, that God is standing by Moses but he has turned against the people because despite every act of God that they have seen to this point, they are quick to forget and quick to turn, it, turn away to human idols. Moses has every right to stand aside and let God enact his judgment, especially considering that the people have rebelled against him as well as God. However, Moses intercedes for the people. He says, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? 
whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster upon your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars in the heaven. And as the land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. Now, to this point, we've really seen that vengeful God that, that people talk about in the Old Testament. But God listens to Moses' prayer and relents by not bringing judgment upon the people. So what can we learn about God's character from this passage? First. God had the right in his holiness to bring judgment upon a sinful people. However, his mercy was greater than his judgment. In this way, the concept of grace and mercy in the face of judgment are quite present already in the Pentateuch. And second, Moses acts as an intercessor for the Israelites. Only after intercessory prayer does God make known that he will not destroy the people. The verse literally translates, So the Lord renounced the punishment which he had said he would do upon the people. Essentially, that God changed his mind. The New Testament continues the unified portrayal of God's character regarding grace. Paul makes clear that receiving God's grace is associated with sin and becomes effective through the sacrifice of Jesus. Romans 11 presents this concept well when it says, For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, and how unsearchable are his judgments, and how unscrutable his ways. A second example comes from James when discussing God's, or discussing God-like character. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. These are just two of the many passages expressing God's mercy and grace in the New Testament. In summary, I want to emphasize that God's character is unchanging and that the expression of God's character is unified in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We are not viewing two different gods or a God that somehow changed his ways, for God's grace always trumps his judgment. Before we, we conclude this lecture, I want to close with a quick tip for biblical interpretation. After you have worked through the passage under study, analyzing its language and its flow of thought, Use your results to summarize your sense of central themes or messages within the passage. You might think of this summary as an attempt to answer these questions. What is the passage seeking to communicate, and how does it go about communicating it? This will help you get out of the trees and back into the forest. And therefore, you can stay focused on the entire passage and the overall message. Thanks for being part of the course, and have a great day.